Welcome to one of the additional Bible studies for Waymaker, Messianic, Jewish, and Christian Center USA. We welcome everyone who is here with us today, and for those who will listen in later on the archives as well. And we pray that this is a blessing to each and every one of you. Well, the additional Bible study that we're doing today is from the Passion Translation, and we're going to complete 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 16 today. Before we get started with that, we're going to open with our opening prayer. Father God, we just want to thank you for today. For Every day is a gift from you, and we know that you are the lifter of our heads, and we are very grateful for each and every day that you give to us. We want to thank you for your word, and we want to ask your Holy Spirit to, to bless us with fresh revelation, to open the eyes of our heart and ears of our heart, that we may be receptive to the word that we're hearing and reading today. Father God, we give you all of our praise. You're an amazing and awesome God. There is no one like you. We honor you, and all glory goes to you, and we pray this prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. Well, as with um, the Tanakh, which is an additional Bible study, this is also an additional Bible study. We won't be doing any recaps. If there's anything along the way that I, um, I want to address, I will do it as we go. Um, with this Bible, there are footnotes. So if there's anything particular that um, I want to share with you with the footnotes that stand out um, like an extra special nugget there uh, for you, I will certainly do so. Otherwise, we're going to get started um, with 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The beginning title is Love is Greater Than Knowledge. Now, let me address the issue of food offered in sacrifice to idols. It seems that everyone believes his own opinion is right on this matter. How easily we get puffed up over our, our opinions. Now, this is again Paul addressing um, this is the first letter to the Corinthians that he wrote. So this is, this is uh, Paul addressing the Corinthian church. But love builds up this structure of our new life. If anyone thinks of himself as a know-it-all, he still has a lot to learn. But if a person passionately loves God, he will possess the knowledge of God. Concerning food sacrifices, as offerings to idols, we all know that an idol is nothing, for there, there is no God but one, although there may be many so-called gods, and that's those gods, that, that is in, not in capitals, it's little g gods, in this world and in heaven, there may be many, quote, gods, lords, and masters, yet for us, there is only one God, the Father. He is the source of all things, and our lives are lived for him. And there is one Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, through whom we, we and all things exist. But not everyone has this revelation, for some were formerly idolaters who consider idols as real and living. That's why they consider the food offered to that, quote, God, unquote, as defiled, and their weak consciences become defiled if they eat if they eat it yes we know that what you eat will not bring you closer to god you are no better if you don't eat certain foods and no better if you do but you must be careful that the liberty you exercise in eating food offered to idols doesn't offend the weak believers for if a believer with a weak conscience sees you who have, have, have a greater understanding dining in an idol's temple, won't this be a temptation to him to violate his own conscience and eat food offered to idols? So in effect, by exercising your understanding of freedom, you have ruined this weak believer, a brother for whom Christ has died. And when you offend weaker believers by wounding their consciences, in this way you also offend the anointed one. So I conclude, that if my eating certain food deeply offends my brother and hinder, hinders his advancing Christ, I will never eat it again. 
I don't want to be guilty of causing my brother or sister to be wounded and defeated. Chapter 9, Paul's Apostolic Freedom. Am I not completely free and unrestrained? Absolutely. Am I not an apostle? Of course. Haven't I had a personal encounter with our, with our Jesus face to face and continue to see him? Emphatically, yes. Aren't you all the proof of my ministry in the Lord? Certainly. If others do not recognize me as their apostle, at least you are bound to do so. For now your lives are joined to the Lord. You are the living proof, the certificate of my apostleship. So to those who want to continually criticize my apostolic ministry, here's my statement of defense. Don't we apostles have the right to be supported financially? Don't we have the right to travel accompanied by our believing wives and be supported as a couple, as do the other apostles, such as Peter the Rock and the Lord's brothers? Of course we do. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to stop working for a living? Responsibility to financially support God's servants. Who serves in the military at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not enjoy the grapes for himself? Who would nurture and shepherd a flock and never get to drink its fresh milk? Am I merely giving you my own opinions or does the Torah teach the same things, for it is written in the law of Moses, you should never put a muzzle over the mouth of an ox while he is treading out the grain. Tell me, is God only talking about oxen here? Doesn't he also give us this principle so that we won't withhold support from his workers? It was written so that we would understand that the one spiritually plowing and spiritually treading out the grain also labors with the expectation of enjoying the harvest. So if we've sowed many spiritual gifts among you, is it too much to expect to reap material gifts from you? And if you have supported others, don't we rightfully deserve this privilege even more? But as you know, we haven't used that right. Instead, we have continued to support ourselves so that we would never be a hindrance to the spread of the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that the priests employed in sacred duty in the temple are provided for by temple resources, and the priests who serve in the temple are provide, uh, and the priests who serve, I'm sorry, at the altar receive a portion of the offerings, and that is th that is definitely so. That is actually in the Torah. That is that that is their inheritance. Um, that was the Levites' inheritance, and and the Lord was also their inheritance. In the same way, the Lord has directed those who proclaim the gospel to receive their living by the gospel. As for me, I prefer to never use any of these rights for myself. And keep in mind that I'm not writing all this because I'm hinting that you should support me. Paul renounces his rights for the sake of the gospel. Actually, I'd rather die than to have anyone rob me of this joyous reason for boasting. For you see, even though I proclaim the good news, I can't take the credit for my labors for I am compelled to fulfill my duty for completing this work. It would be agony to me if I did not constantly preach the gospel. If it were my own idea to preach as a way to make a living, I would expect to be paid, since it's not my idea, but God's who commissioned me. I'm entrusted with the stewardship of the gospel, whether or not I'm paid. So then, where is my reward? It is found in continually depositing the good news into people's hearts, without obligation, free of charge, and not insisting on my rights to be financially supported. Paul, a servant to all. Now, even though I am free from obligations to others, I joyfully make myself a servant to all in order to win as many converts as possible. I became Jewish, the Jewish people, in order to win them to the Messiah. I became like one under the law to gain the people who were stuck under the law, even though I myself am not under the law. And to those who are without the Jewish laws, I became like them as one without the Jewish laws in order to win them. Although I am not outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, I became weak to the weak to win the weak. I have adapted to the culture of every place I've gone so that I could more easily win people to Christ. I've done all this so that I would be become God's partner for the sake of the, of the gospel. And 
Paul's disciplined lifestyle, isn't it obvious that all runners on the racetrack keep on running to win, but only one receives the victor's prize, yet each one of you must run the race to be victorious. A true athlete will be disciplined in every respect, practicing constant self-control in order to win a laurel wreath that quickly withers. But we run our race to win a victor's crown that will last forever. For that reason, I don't run just for exercise or box like one throwing aimless punches, but I train like a champion athlete. I subdue my body and get it under my control so that after preaching the good news to others, I myself won't be disqualified. Now, the four questions at the beginning of chapter nine um, are forceful rhetorical questions. They're emphatic in Greek construct, which means they each demand an answer in the affirmative. Am I not completely free and unrestrained? Absolutely. Am I not an apostle? Of course. Haven't I had a personal encounter with our Jesus face to face and continue to see him? Emphatically, yes. Aren't you all the proof of my ministry in the Lord? Certainly. So there was an emphatic um, affirmative answer. Although some commentators view these four questions as qualifications of an apostle, there is no indication that this is indeed the purpose of his questions. Paul is defending his apostleship, not listing qualifications of apostles. The seven arguments he makes in defense of his apostleship are the following. He enjoys freedom from all bondage, both from the world and religion. He had, he had face-to-face encounters with Jesus. The formation of the church of Corinth validates his apostleship because he, he planted that church. His unselfish lifestyle resulted in not demanding to be paid for his ministry. He was given a divine stewardship. He was determined to win everyone through the gospel of Christ. He lived a disciplined life in order to succeed in the obstacle course of ministry for Christ. Okay, chapter 10, learning from Israel's failures. My dear fellow believers, you need to understand that all of our Jewish ancestors who walked through a wilderness long ago were under the glory cloud and passed through the waters of the sea on both sides. They were all baptized into the cloud of glory, into the fellowship of Moses, and into the sea. They all ate the same heavenly manna and drank water from the same spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their dead bodies were scattered around the wilderness. Now all these things serve as types and pictures for us, and we could also call them types and shadows. Lessons that teach us not to fail in the same way by callously, callously craving worthless things and practicing idolatry as some of them did, for it is written, the people settled in to their unrestrained revelry with feasting and drinking. Then they rose up and became wildly out of control. Neither should we commit sexual, sexual immorality, as some of them did, which caused the death of 23,000 on a single day. Nor should we ever provoke the Lord, as some of them did, by putting him to outrageous tests that resulted in their death from snake bites day after day. And we must not embrace their ways by complaining, grumbling with discontent, as many of them did, and were killed by the destroyer. All the tests they endured on their way through the wilderness are, are a symbolic picture, an example that provide us with a warning so that we can learn through what they experienced. For we live in a time when the purpose of all the ages past is now completing its goal within us. So beware if you think it could never happen to you lest your pride becomes your downfall. History is so very, very important. And this is what I will always say. You know, we can learn from the mistakes of history instead of repeating them. Unfortunately, as we see in the Bible, we see that history repeated itself. Um, they, they, did not, um, they did not follow what God was commanding. Many of them forgotten what they were supposed to do. There was a point that the scrolls were actually missing when we when we when we read about 
King Josiah and how those scrolls were found. And, and when King Josiah realized how far the people had had strayed from God, he tore his clothes. Um, and then there was a revival that happened, of course, in the land. But um, we don't have to repeat history. We have the history. We have the history in front of us with the Bible. Definitely, we have also, we have world history in front of us. This is why it is important not to knock down monuments, not to erase history as if it didn't happen. We need to embrace history so we don't repeat the same things over and over again to learn from them. You know, no, um, there's not one country that hasn't made mistakes on this planet, but it's important to leave that history intact so it can be learned from. To erase it is only being doomed to repeat it in some way, shape, or form. And that is not a good thing. In chapter 10, Paul is also declaring five motivating principles for his ministry. Always start by finding common ground with those you want to reach. Avoid projecting to others that you are a know-it-all. Accept everyone regardless of his or her issues and be sensitive to the culture of others. And use every opportunity to share the good news of, of Jesus Christ with people. I'm sorry, that was also in, in chapter 9, just to recap that. So the cloud of glory here um, is a picture of the Holy Spirit that, that Paul is actually describing in chapter 10. Also, the interesting thing is, you know, when we think about our ancestors crossing the Red Sea, we can think of that as a type of shadow, a type and shadow of baptism. And there are at least eight distinct baptisms mentioned in the New Testament, the baptism of John. Um, the baptism of, of Yeshua, a baptism of suffering, a, a baptism into the cloud of glory, a baptism into the sea, a picture of redemption, a believer's baptism in water, baptism into Christ and into his body, and a baptism in the Holy Spirit. So we can, we, we can certainly see that as we read through the New Testament. Now, also, in this chapter, it is mentioned that Christ is the anointed rock of truth and the rock of shelter. So the people drank of his living water right there at the beginning. The miracle of the rock of Christ provided them with water wherever they journeyed. He is a fountain that never runs dry, for he will never leave us alone in a wilderness. Also, he is the manna from heaven. He's the bread of life. Paul is addressing our ancestors as, as, you know, they were feasting and drinking and fell into immorality. Um, and that that was not a good thing. And he's warning them as well not, not to fall into that. The way of escape. We all experience times of testing, which is normal for every human being. But God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, nature, and timing of every test or trial you face so that you can bear it. Each And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For a, along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out of it victoriously. And here's a footnote on that. That is God's faith, faithfulness and grace will limit the severity of every test and prevent you from being tested beyond your ability to cope. Unlimited grace is available for every believer who faces hardship, temptations, and seasons of difficulty. Communion. My cherished friends keep on running far away from idolatry. I know I am writing to thoughtful people, so carefully consider what I say. For when we pray for the blessing of the, of the communion cup, isn't this our co-participation with the blood of Jesus? And the bread that we distribute, isn't this the bread of our co-participation with the body of Christ? For although we're many, we become one loaf of bread and one body as we feast together on one loaf. Consider the people of Israel when they fell into idolatry. When they ate the sacrifices offered to the gods, weren't they becoming communal participants 
in what was sacrificed. Now, am I saying that idols and the sacrifices offered to them have any value? Absolutely not. However, I am implying that when an unbeliever offers a sacrifice to an idol, it is not offered to the true God, but to a demon. I don't want you to be participants with demons. You can't drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't feast at the table of the Lord and feast at the table of demons. Who would ever want to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Is that something you think you're strong enough to endure? You, living for the Lord's glory, you say, under grace, there are no rules and we're free to do anything we please. Not exactly. Because not everything promotes growth in others. Your slogan, we're allowed to do anything we choose, may be true, but not everything causes the spiritual advancement of others. So don't always seek what is best for you at the expense of another. Yes, you are free to eat anything without worrying about your conscience, for the earth and all its abundance belongs to the Lord. So if an unbeliever invites you to dinner, go ahead and eat whatever is served without asking questions concerning where it came from. But if he goes out of his way to inform you that the meat was actually an offering sacrificed to idols, then you should pass, not only for his sake, but because of his conscience. I'm talking about someone else's conscience, not yours. What good is there in doing what you please if it's condemned by someone else? So if I voluntarily participate, why should I judge for celebrating my freedom? Whether you eat or drink, live your life in a way that glorifies and honors God and make sure you're not offending Jew or Greeks or any part of God's assembly over your personal preferences. Here again, he's referring to Jew or non-Jew, uh, but Greeks are the non-Jews. In, in, in his writing here. Follow my example, for if I try to please everyone in all things, rather than putting my liberty first, I sincerely attempt to do anything I can, can so that others may be saved. Okay. Head coverings, chapter 11. I want you to pattern your lives after me, just as I pattern mine after Christ. And I give you full credit for always keeping me in mind as you follow carefully the substance of my instructions that I've taught you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the source of every human alive, and Adam was the source of Eve, and God is the source of the Messiah. Any man who leads public worship and prays or prophesies with a shawl hanging down over his head shows disrespect to his head, which is Christ. And if any woman in place of leadership within the church praise or prophesies in public with her long hair disheveled she shows disrespect to her head which is her husband for this would be the same as having her head shaved if a woman who wants to be in leadership will not conform to the customs of what is proper for women she might as well cut off her hair but if it's disgraceful for her to have her hair cut off or her head shaved let her cover her head So uh, a man in leadership is under no obligation to have his head covered in public gatherings because he is the portrait of God and reflects his glory. The woman, on the other hand, reflects the glory of her husband, for man was not created from woman, but woman from man. But the, by the same token, the man was not created because the woman needed him. The woman was created because the man needed her. For this reason, she should have authority over the head over the head because of the angels. So then I have to insist that in the Lord, neither is woman inferior to man, nor is man inferior to woman. For just as woman was taken from the side of man in the same way man is taken from the womb of a woman, God as the source of all things designed it this way. So then you can decide for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her hair unbound? Doesn't our long established cultural tradition teach us that if a man has long hair, that it is ornamentally arranged, it invites disgrace. But if a woman has long hair that is ornamentally arranged, it is her glory. This is because long hair is the endowment that God has given her as a head covering. As long as it's not disheveled and all over the place and, you know, that it's 
like not tangled and everything else and matted and what have you, basically. And if that's the case, it needs to be covered. In other words, if someone wants to quarrel about this, I want you to know that we have no intention to ar start an argument, neither I nor the congregations of God. Notice also here that Paul affirms the right of women to pray and prophesy in public worship services if, if, and, and places women in leadership roles, but um, then addresses the hair. Apparently, um, there was a common practice of women cutting off their hair in Corinth, um, ungodly women, that is. And for the public worship of that era, a woman would have her long hair braided and covered up so she would not be mistaken as a cult priestess of Isis or Di Dionysus. And also a nugget here, in Christ there is no, this is a footnote, there is no fundamental difference between man and woman as both were created by God with different roles and personalities. Although the first woman, Eve, came from Adam, Every other man came from a woman, a mother, um, and to say that women are inferior to men is equal, equal to saying that all men are inferior to their mothers. Okay, another um, footnote here on chapter 11, verse 10. This literal, literal translation is one of the most difficult verses in all of the New Testament to translate and to interpret properly. Scholars and translators are divided in how to express this verse with proper meaning first paul uses the greek word authority which is used for the authority of god kings and rulers um he used a, used a greek word which explained a translated authority and can be translated might or or right it never occurs as a, a metaphor speaking of a piece of apparel this is not a symbol of authority a true authority on on the motherhead under which she ministers. Before Pentecost, the woman was not seen as as anyone with authority, but at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon men and women, giving each person the authority to take the gospel with power to the ends of the earth and the prophecy under direction of the Holy Spirit. Because actually the women were at home. They weren't sent off to school to, to study the Torah. That was something for the men. But here, when Jesus was here, there were women that were disciples under Jesus even. So they were in the upper room, and yes, the Holy Spirit fell on everyone that was there, both men and women. The gospel both begins and ends with a visitation of angels to women. Uh, the angel Gabriel came to Mary, and the angels of God greeted the women at the empty tomb. However, the Aramaic word used here is a homonym that can both that can mean both power and covering veil. This may explain the variation of the Greek text. So there's also mentioned prayer shawl can be used as well. But as far as covering goes, again, if a woman has long hair that is ornamentally arranged, it is her glory. And this is because long hair is the endowment that God has given her as a head covering. So the hair itself is a covering. In other words, the, the Lord's table is the next section in chapter 11. Now on this next matter, I wish... I could commend you, but I cannot, because when you meet together as a church family, it is doing more harm than good. So he is actually dealing with the current Corinthian church here. I've been told many times that when you meet as a congregation, divisions and cliques emerge. And to some extent, this doesn't surprise me. Differences of opinion are unavoidable, yet they will reveal which ones among you truly have God's approval. When all of your house churches gather as one church family, you are not really properly celebrating the Lord's Supper. For when it comes time to eat, 
some gobble down their food before anything is given to others. One is left hungry while others become drunk. Don't you all have homes where you can eat and, dr eat, eat and drink? Don't you realize that you're showing a superior attitude by humiliating those who have nothing? Are you trying to show contempt for God's beloved church? How should I address this appropriately? If you're looking for my approval, you won't find it. I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and gave thanks. Then he distributed it to the disciples and said, Take it and eat your filth. It is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same with a cup of wine after supper and said, This cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it, and whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in, in the wrong spirit will be guilty of dishonoring the body and blood of the Lord. So let each individual first evaluate his own attitude and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. This is why when we do communion, we do a preparation ahead of time. Make sure everybody, everybody's heart is right and you're, you're realizing why you're doing this. And it is to remember the Lord and what he has done for us. So you want to be in a right spirit. So let each individual first evaluate his own attitude and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For continually eating and drinking with the wrong spirit will bring judgment upon yourself by not recognizing the body. This, ins this insensitivity is why many of you are weak, chronically ill, and some even dying. If you do not sit in judgment of others, you will avoid judgment yourself. But when we are judged, it is the Lord's training so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my fellow believers, when you assemble as one to share a meal, show respect for one another and wait for all to be served. If you are that hungry, eat at home first so that when you gather together, you will not bring judgment upon yourself. When I come to you, I will answer the other questions you ask me in your letter. Spiritual gifts are, are chapter 12, my fellow believers. I don't want you to be confused about spiritual realities, for you know full well that when you were unbelievers, you were often led astray in one way or another by your worship of idols, which are incapable of talking with you. Therefore, I want to impart to you an understanding of the following. No one speaking by the Spirit of God would ever say Jesus is the accursed one. No one can say Jesus is the Lord Yahweh unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. It is the same Holy Spirit who continues to distribute many varieties of gifts. The Lord Yahweh is one and he is the one who apportions to believers different varieties of ministries. The same God distributes different kinds of, of miracles that occur that accomplish different results through each believer's gift and ministry as he energizes and, activize and activates them. Each believer is given continuous revelation by the Holy Spirit to benefit not just himself, but all varieties of spiritual gifts. Spirit gives to one the gift of the word of wisdom. To another, this same spirit gives the gift of the word of revelation knowledge. And to another, the same gifts the same Spirit gives the gifts of faith, and to another, the same Spirit give, gives gifts of healing, and to another, the power to work miracles, and to another, the gift of prophecy, and to another, the gift to discern what the Spirit is speaking, and to another, the gift of speaking different kinds of tongues, and to another, the gift of interpretation of tongues. There are nine gifts of the, of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. They are still relevant today. No, contrary to what, what um, there's some that are teaching out there, which is incorrect, that they died with the apostles. That's not true. We have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us when we are born again and saved. No, the Holy Spirit did not die with the apostles. Jesus said he is sending the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, to stay with us forever. So 
He is certainly going to stay with us until Yeshua returns. That's for sure. So whoever, please do not follow that, that doctrine that is incorrect. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he decides who, who gets what gifts. Um, and they are still relevant today. In summary, with that, um, that what I just had, had said about the Holy Spirit and gifts, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit delights to give spiritual gifts to his people, the Bride of Christ. These gifts are imparted by God to every believer upon conversion as the Holy Spirit chooses. They will confirm the Word of God and expand the kingdom of God. Spiritual gifts can, can be neglected or misused, but they remain the divine power source for Christ's body on earth. Through teaching, evangelizing, prophesying, and demonstrating the miraculous, God uses his people to expand his kingdom and to establish righteousness on earth through the proper use of the gifts he has given. There is no place in scripture or church history where these gifts were taken away or removed from the body of Christ. This is actually a footnote, so it, it, it's basically confirming what I just addressed prior to reading this. Um, the church moves forward through these divine gifts. Spiritual gifts do not replace the word of God, but the word of God will spread and flourish as the fully equipped body of Christ operates in the wise use of God's enabling power. So definitely they continue. This is a revelation gift of the Holy Spirit to impart an understanding of strategy and insight that only God can give. This is more than simply wisdom, but the clear, clearly crafted word of wisdom to unlock the hearts of people and free the corporate body to move more, to move forward under God's direction. And, and a, this gift of wisdom of the Holy Spirit, not of man, the, be, the best examples of the gift were when Jesus saw Nathanael under the fig tree and knew his true character as a man without guile. And when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and unlocked her heart with the words, go get your husband. The gift of the message of revelation knowledge has been defined by some as the Holy Spirit's impart, impartation through an impression, a vision, or his voice that gives understanding of a person or situation that cannot be known through the natural mind of man. It may be exercised in the prayer for healing. This revelation knowledge is seen in Saul's healing of blindness in, in Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 10 to 11, with Peter's revelation knowledge of Cornelius' servants outside his door and the subsequent salvation of Cornelius and his household, the word of revelation knowledge could also include knowing facts that are unknown to the speaker, such as names, dates, or events to come. The supernatural power of faith released in a believer to do the miracle works of God on the earth the supernatural power of God released through a believer to heal the sick is also mentioned. I, I had already mentioned this includes the divine ability to still a storm, feed a multitude, walk on water, cast out demons, turn water into wine and raise the dead. The gift was one of the distinctive marks of an apostle. This gift um, in verse 10 is a gift of supernatural ability given by the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God in proclamation and at times in predicting the, fu the future, pro or prophesying the future. This is one gift that every believer should desire and never despise. The gifts um, that, that impart a prophetic message is from the Holy Spirit or from a human or... Um, actually to be able to discern whether it was from the Holy Spirit or from a human or demonic source. See, there's three, there's three areas that you could be getting word from, but you want to ask from the Holy Spirit, but to be able to discern what, what is happening is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Discernment is 
greatly needed to the, for the church today to hear the voice of the Lord clearly and to know when defilement is attempting to enter the assembly. So that is real important to know. Um, so we're going to continue with this chapter. Remember, it is the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these different gifts as he chooses for each believer. One body with many parts, just as the human body is one, though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. For by one spirit we were all immersed and mingled into one single body, and no matter our status, whether we are Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. In fact, the human body is not one single part, but rather many parts mingled into one. So if the foot were to say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it's forgetting that it is still a vital part of the body. And if the ear were to say, since I'm not an eye, I'm not really part of the body, it's forgetting that it is still an important part of the body. Think of it this way. If the whole body were just an eyeball, how could it hear sounds? And if the whole body were just an ear, how could it smell different fragrances? But God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. A diversity is required for if the body consisted of one single part, there wouldn't be a body at all. So now we see that there are many different differing parts and functions, but one body. And I want to add here, as the body of Yeshua, the body needs to start working together, just as the physical body needs to work together in order to survive. Each, each of the, the systems complement one another. Um, so does the body of the spiritual body of Messiah. And I pray for the unity to, to come. No competition for importance within the body. It would be wrong for an eye to say to the hand, I don't need you, and equally wrong if the head said to the foot, I don't need you. In fact, the weaker our parts, the more vital and essential they are. The body parts are the body parts we think are less honorable, we treat with greater respect, and the body parts that need to be covered in public, we treat with propriety and clothe them. But some of our body parts don't require as much attention. Instead, God has mingled the body parts together, giving greater honor to the lesser members who lacked it. He has done that intentionally so that every member would look after the others with mutual concern, so that there will be no division in the body. In that way, whatever happens to one member happens to all. If one suffers, everyone suffers. If one is honored, everyone rejoices. One body with different gifts. You are the body of the anointed one, and each of you is unique and, uh, and vital, and a vital part of it. God has placed in the church the following. First, apostles. Now, this is the other thing that people want to say. Oh, there's, you know, they want to discredit the fivefold ministry, but God has appointed that. Yeshua has left this. And the fivefold ministry is intact and should be in operation in each congregation. Yes, there are apostles today. Because here, here, here it is stated here. God is placed in the church. This is what the church needs to consist of. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then those with the gifts of miracles, gifts of divine healing, gifts of revelation, knowledge, gifts of leadership and gifts of different kinds of tongues. Now, everyone is an apostle or a prophet or a teacher. Not everyone performs miracles or has the gifts of healing or speaks in tongues or interprets tongues. But you should all consistently boil over with passion and speaking the higher gifts. And now I will show you a superior way to live that is beyond comparison. The fivefold ministry is this, apostles. I'm going to state, state them. There are apostles, there are prophets, there's teachers, there are pastors, and there are evangelists. That's the fivefold ministry. Now, all are called to be evan to evangelize, yes. But not everyone is called to, 
to be in the office of the quote evangelist. There's a little bit difference here. Okay. A lot of people can prophesy, but that doesn't make them a, that they should be in the office of the prophet or prophetess. It, that's, a, that's a specific calling. But that, that, this, that is the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Chapter 13, love, the motivation of our lives. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth, many languages, and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possess unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains, but I've never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and, and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honestly and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat for it never gives up. And a lot of this is used, it's, some of this is used in, in, in marriage, uh, in marriage ceremonies and because it really, really fits that, it, it fits that scenario as well. Perfect love. Love never stops loving and extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our, our present knowledge and our prophecies are, are but partial, but when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childless matters, for I saw things like a child and reasoned like a child, but the day came when I matured and set aside my childish ways. For now we see but a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror, but one day we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete now, but one day I will understand everything, just as everything about me has been fully understood. Until then, there are these things that remain, faith, hope, and love, yet love surpasses them all. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. Chapter 14, The Proper Use of Spiritual Gifts. It is good that you are enthusiastic and passionate about spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. When someone speaks in tongues, no one understands a word he says because he is, he is not speaking to people, but to God. He is speaking intimate mysteries in the spirit. But when someone prophesies, he speaks to encourage people to build them up and to bring them comfort. The one who speaks in tongues advances his own spiritual progress, while the one who prophesies builds up the church. I would be delighted if you all spoke in tongues, but I desire even more that you impart prophetic revelation to others. Greater gain comes through the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless there is interpretation so that it builds up the entire church. My dear friends, what good is it if I come to you always speaking in tongues? But if I come with a clear revelation from God or with insight or with a prophecy or with clear teaching, I can enrich you. Similarly, if musical instruments such as flutes or stringed instruments are out of tune and don't play the arrangement clearly, how will anyone recognize the melody? If the bugle makes a garbled sound, who will recognize the signal to show up for the, for the battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak in a language that's easily understood, how will anyone know what you're talking about? 
you might as well save your breath. I suppose that the, wor the world has all sorts of languages and each conveys meaning to the ones who speak it, but I am like a foreigner. If I don't understand the language and the speaker will be like a foreigner to me. And that's what's happening among you. You are so passionate about embracing the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now become even more passionate about the things that strengthen the entire church. So then if you speak in a tongue, pray for the interpretation to be able to unfold the meaning of what you are saying. For if I'm praying in a tongue, my spirit is engaged in prayer, but I have no clear understanding of what it is being said. So here's what I've concluded. I will pray in the spirit, but I will also pray with my mind engaged. I will sing rap rapturous praises in the spirit, but I will also sing with my mind engaged. Otherwise, if you're praising God in your spirit, how could someone without the gift participate by adding his amen to your giving of thanks since he doesn't have a clue of what you're saying? Your praise to God is admirable, but it does nothing to strengthen and build up others. I give thanks to God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church setting, I would rather speak five words that can be understood than 10,000 exotic words in a tongue. That way I could have a role in teaching others. The functional, the function of the gifts. Beloved one, don't remain as immature children in your reasoning as it relates to evil be like newborns but in your thinking being mature adults for it stands written in the law i will bring my message to the people with strange tongues for and foreign lips yet even then they will still not listen to me says the lord so then tongues are not a not a sign for believers but a miracle for unbelievers prophecy on the other hand is not for unbelievers but a miracle sign for believers. If the entire church comes together and everyone is speaking in tongues, won't the visitors say that you've lost your minds? But if everyone is prophesying and an unbeliever or one without the gift enters your meeting, he will be convicted by all that he hears and, and it will be called to account for the intimate secrets of his heart will be brought to light. He will be mystified and fall face down worship and say, God is truly among you. Guidelines for the use of the gifts. Beloved friends, what does all this imply? When you conduct your meetings, you should always let everything be done to build up the church family. Whether you share a song of praise, a teaching, a divine revelation, or a tongue and interpretation, let each one contribute what strengthens others. If someone speaks in a tongue, it should be two or three, one after another with someone interpreting. If there's no one with the interpretation, then he should remain silent in the meeting, content to speak to himself and to God. And the same with prophecy. Let two or three prophets prophesy and let the other prophets carefully evaluate and discern what is being said. But if someone receives a revelation while someone else is still speaking, the one speaking should conclude and allow the one with fresh revelation the opportunity to share it. For you can all prophesy in turn and in an environment where all present can be instructed, encouraged, and, and strengthened. Keep in mind that the anointing to prophesy doesn't mean that the speaker is out of control. He can wait his turn. For God is the God of harmony, not confusion, as is the pattern in all the churches of God's holy believers. The women should be respectfully silent during the evaluation of, of prophecy in the meetings. They are not allowed to interrupt but are to be in support in a support role as in fact the law teaches. If they want to inquire about something, let them ask their husbands when they get home for a woman embarrasses herself when she constantly interrupts the church meeting. This is what was happening in the church. Um, Things were being prophesied, there, there was preaching being done, um, and they were interrupting everything. And so they weren't getting things accomplished either. So, and understand the women were not going, going to school at that time uh, either. So if they didn't understand what Paul was saying was have them just be quiet while things are being accomplished and they don't understand, you know, then they can, they can find out at home. 
Do you actually think that you were you were start, the starting point for the word of God going forth? Were you the only ones it was sent to? I don't think so. If anyone considers himself to be a prophet or a spiritual person, let him discern that what I'm writing to you carries the Lord's authority. And if anyone continues not to recognize this, he should not be recognized. So, beloved friends, with all this in mind, be passionate to prophesy. And don't forbid anyone from speaking in tongue, tongues, doing all things in a beautiful and orderly way. Okay, here is the footnote here. Um, the theme Paul is addressing here is unity and mutual edification, not simply the role of women. Women are permitted to speak in church, to prophesy, and to minister the gospel. Paul is apparently prohibiting interrupting the leaders as they evaluate prophetic utterances. And apparently they were just saying, what's going on? What's happening? And, you know, and, and such and wanting an explanation. And it was disrupting the flow of the pro prophetic word that was coming. Um, it is likely that Paul was addressing a specific issue taking place in the church fellowship of Corinth with women interrupting the meeting with their opinions and questions about the prophetic words just spoken, possibly even words spoken by their husbands. So interrupting the meeting was implied um, and it disrupted the flow as well. Chapter 15, The Resurrection of Christ. Dear friends, let me give you clearly the heart of the gospel that I've preached to you, the good news that you have heartily received and on which you stand for it is through the revelation of the gospel that you are being saved if you fashion your life firmly to the message i've taught you unless you have believed in vain for i have shared with you what i have received and what is of utmost importance the messiah died for our sins fulfilling the prophecies of the scriptures he was buried in a tomb and was raised from the dead after three days as foretold in the scriptures then he appeared to Peter the Rock and to the twelve apostles. He also appeared to more than 500 of his followers at the same time, most of whom are still alive as I write this, though a few have passed away. Then he appeared to Jacob and to, and to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared in front of me, like one born prematurely ripped from the womb. Yes, I am the most insignificant of all the apostles, unworthy even to be called. An apostle because i hunted down believers and persecuted god's church but god's amazing grace has made me who i am and his grace to me was not fruitless in fact i worked harder than all the rest yet not in my own strength but god's for his empowering grace is poured out upon me so this is what we all have taught you and whether it was through me or someone else you have now believed the gospel the importance of the resurrection, the message we preach is Christ, who has been raised from the dead. So how could any of you possibly say there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no such thing as a resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching has been for nothing, and your faith is useless. Moreover, if the dead are not raised, that would mean that we are false witnesses who are misrepresenting God. And that would mean that we have preached a lie stating that God raised him from the dead if in reality he didn't. If the dead aren't raised up, that would mean that Christ has not been raised up either. And if Christ is not alive, you are still lost in your sins and your faith is a fantasy. It would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away have simply perished. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ is limited to this life on earth, we deserve to be pitied more than all others. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead as the first fruit of a great resurrection harvest of those who have died. For since death came through a man, Adam, it is fitting that the resurrection of the dead has also come through a man, Christ. Even as all who are in Adam die, so all who are in Christ will be made alive but each one in his proper order, Christ the first fruits, and those who belong to Christ in his presence. Then the final stage of completion comes when he will bring to an end every other rulership, authority, and power, 
and he will hand over his kingdom to Father God. Until then, he is destined to reign as king until all hostility has been subdued and placed under his feet. And the last enemy to be subdued and eliminated is death itself. The Father has placed all things in subjection under the feet of Christ. Yet when it says all things, it is understood that the Father does not include himself, for he is the one who placed all things in subjection to Christ. However, when everything is subdued and in submission to him, then the Son himself will be subject to the Father who put all things under his feet. This is so that Father God will be everything in everyone. Implications of the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, what do these people think they're doing when they are baptized for the dead? If the dead aren't raised, why be baptized for them? And why would we be risking our lives every day? My brothers and sisters, I continually face death. This is as sure as my boasting of you and our co-union together in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives me confidence to share my experience with you. Tell me, why did I fight wild beasts in Ephesus if my hope is in this life only? What was the point of that? If the dead do not rise, then let's party all night for tomorrow we die. So stop fooling yourselves. Evil companions will corrupt good morals and characters. Come back to your right senses and awaken to what is right. Repent from your sinful ways, for some have no knowledge of God's wonderful love. You should be ashamed that you make me write this way to you. Our resurrection body. I can almost hear someone saying, how can the dead come back to life? And what kind of body will they have when they are resurrected? Foolish man, don't you know that what you sow in the ground doesn't germinate unless it dies? And what you sow is not the body that will come into being, but the bare seed. And it's hard to tell whether it's wheat or some other seed. But when it dies, God gives it a new form a body to fulfill its purpose. And he sees to it that each seed gets a new body of its own and becomes the plant he designed it to be. All flesh is not identical. Animals have one flesh and human beings another. Birds have their distinct flesh and fish another. In the same way, there are earthly bodies and heavenly bodies. There is a splendor of the celestial body and a different one for the earthly. There is the radiance of the sun and different differing radiance for the moon and for those stars. Even the stars differ in their shining. And that's how it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in decay, but will be raised in immortality. It is sown in humiliation, but will, but will be raised in glorification. It is sown in weakness, but, but will be raised in power. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body, for it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became the life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual didn't come first. The natural precedes the spiritual. I'm sorry, precedes the spiritual. The first man was from the dust of the earth. The second man is from the Lord Jehovah, from the realm of heaven. The first one made from dust has a race of people just like him who are also made from dust. The one sent from heaven has a race of heavenly people who are just like him. Once we carry the likeness of the man of dust, not, but, not, but now let us carry the likeness of the man of heaven. So when we're born again and saved, we carry the likeness of the man of heaven from Yeshua, Jesus. Transformation. Now I tell you this, my brothers and sisters, flesh and blood are not able to inherit God's kingdom realm, and neither will that which is decaying be able to inherit what is incorruptible. Listen, and I will tell you a divine mystery. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. And now this is, now people want to know, uh, they, don't, they don't say the word rapture. Well, uh, if you're not going to die, you're going to be transformed. Um, Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, well, yeah, this is talking about the rapture right here. Enoch was raptured. 
Elijah was raptured. Neither one of them died. They were taken to heaven alive. It will happen in an instant, in the twinkling of his eye. For when the last trumpet is sounded, the dead will come back to life. We will be indestructible and we will be transformed. Now, the dead will come back to life, but if we're still alive during that time, we'll be transformed. But we will discard our mortal clothes and slip into a body that is imperishable. What is mortal now will be exchanged for immortality. And when that which is mortal puts on immortality and what now decays is exchanged for what will never decay, then the scripture will be fulfilled that says, death is swallowed up by a triumphant victory. So death, tell me, where is your victory? Tell me, death, where is your sting? It is sin that gives death its sting, sting and the law that gives sin its power. But we thank God for giving us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So now, beloved ones, stand firm and secure. Live your lives with an unshakable confidence. We know that we prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our labor productive with fruit that endures. Chapter 16, an offering for believers in Jerusalem. Now, concerning the collection, I want you to take for God's holy believers in Jerusalem who are in need. I want you to follow the same instructions I gave the churches of Galatia. Every Sunday, each of you make a generous offering by taking a portion of whatever God has blessed you with and place it in safekeeping. And I won't have to make a special appeal when I come. When I arrive, I will send your gift to the poor in Jerusalem, along with a letter of explanation carried by those whom you approve. If it seems advisable for me to accompany them, I'll be glad to have them travel with me. Paul's plans to visit Corinth. I plan to be traveling through Macedonia, and afterward I will visit you and perhaps stay there for a while or even spend winter with you. Afterwards, you can send me on my journey wherever I go next with your financial support, for it's not my desire to just see you in passing, but I would like to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Regardless, I will remain in Ephesus until the Feast of Pentecost. There's an amazing door of opportunity standing wide open for me to minister here, even though there are many who oppose and stand against me. When Timothy arrives, make sure that he feels at home while he's with you, for he is advancing the Lord's work just as I am. Don't let anyone disparage or look down on him, but kindly help him on his way with financial support so that he may come back to me, for I am waiting for him and the brothers to return. Now about our brother Ap Apollos, I've tried hard to convince him to come visit you with the other brothers, but it's simply not the right time him now. But don't worry, he'll come when he has the opportunity. Paul's final instructions and greetings. Remember to stay alert and hold firmly to all that you believe. Be mighty and full of courage. Let love and kindness be the motivation behind all that you do. Dear brothers and sisters, I have a request to make of you. Give special recognition to Stephanus and his family, for they were the first converts in Achaia. And that's a-C-H-A-I-A, -A. and they have fully devoted themselves to serve God's holy people. I urge you to honor and support them and all those like them who work so diligently for the Lord. I was delighted when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived, for they've made up for your absence. They have refreshed my spirit. In the same way, they refresh yours. Be sure to honor people like this. All the churches of Western Turkey send their loving greetings to you. Aquila and, and Prisca greet you warmly in the Lord with those of their house church. All of your fellow believers here in Ephesus send their greetings. Greet one another with a sacred kiss. In my own handwriting, I, Paul, add my loving greeting. If anyone doesn't sincerely love the Lord, he deserves to be doomed. As an outcast, our Lord has come 
May the grace and favor, favor of our Lord Jesus be with you. I send my love to all who are joined in the life of Jesus, the anointed one. And that is the end of 1 Corinthians. So next week we are going to cover all of 2 Corinthians. And there are 13 chapters in there, but they're not. Well, some of them are longer than others, but uh, we might we might do that in one or two parts, depending on how quickly we, we move through it, because, of course, we also have an introduction. But anyway, that is it for this week. Father God, we want to thank you for this powerful word. We want to thank you. Thank you for clarification of the word that, that was given through Apostle Paul to help guide that early church in the right way, to correct the things that they were doing wrong in a loving manner. And this is how the church should be run. And, and also we, we continue to pray for the unification of the body of Messiah so that the church, the whole church, the ecclesia can stand united together. In this day, we need the entire church to stand together as one unified body. And this I pray for. Father God, we give you all our praise and all honor and glory belong to you. You're an amazing and awesome God. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. We thank you for guiding us in all that, that you guide us and everything that we do. We look to you as our guide, as our heavenly father. And we just love you. We pray this prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen, and Amen. We're going to move into an altar call, and then we will close out this week's Bible study with the Passion Translation. If you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is an opportunity. Salvation can only be achieved through the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. Salvation is deliverance from sin and their consequences. And the wages of sin are death and separation from God. Yeshua is his Hebrew name, is Jesus' Hebrew name, and it means salvation. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Yeshua died for us. And we just read that in Corinthians that you now all, all die because of the first Adam, because that's where the sin originated in the in the Garden of Eden. But we all come back to life. We're all brought back to life. We're all all have that resurrection uh, of life through Yeshua, who actually reversed the curse. So it's because of Yeshua that we have the opportunity of eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. Yeshua took our illnesses and afflictions also. And by his wounds, we are healed. He took all the sins of the world with him on the cross. So confessing our sins and asking for forgiveness is all that we need to do. All we need to do is call on the name of Jesus. There's nothing fancy that we need to do. He already paid everyone's sin debt in full with his own life. But you have that choice. God always gives us free will. Jesus is returning though. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Don't miss out on the opportunity to be saved, born again into the family of God, and to have that blessed assurance of eternal life. Eternity is forever. This life you're living is temporary. And I know there's people out there, they joke around and say they're going to have a party in hell together. That, you know, hell is not a big deal. You know, half the people are going to hell and it's going to be, you know, they'll know people there. You're not going to be with people there. You're going to be separated. You're going to be solitude. Uh, you're going to be tormented 
for eternity. That's not a place that you really want to be. Hell was created for the devil and the third of the angels that have fallen, not for humanity. It is not the place that God wants his beloved creation to be. He created you in his image. He loves you. Every single person on this earth he loves. Jesus took every sin, even the most vile sin with him. So don't think that you have fallen too far that he will not forgive you. You just got to call on his name and he will forgive you. That's not to say that there's not consequences in this world, depending on what was done. Um, however, you can have the assurance of, of eternal life through Jesus. First John chapter one, verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he is the one that paid all of our sin debts in full. Every single person. If you would like to be born again and a member of the family of God, become a child of God. If you want to be saved, you can say this simple prayer with me right now. Dear God, I come to you today to confess that I'm a, that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I understand that Savior is Jesus. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. I do believe that he died on a cross. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose again. And I do believe he's coming again to rule and reign as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus, I, I come before you today to confess that I'm a sinner. I'm confessing my sins to you and asking for forgiveness. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Thank you for paying my sin debt in full. And I do accept the gift of salvation and eternal life that you offer. I do declare that you are my Lord and Savior from this day forward. Please send your Holy Spirit to live inside me, to guide me in all of your ways for the rest of my life. And I believe through you and you alone, Yeshua, that I'm saved, healed, born again, set free and delivered from sin and the consequences of sin. And now I am healthy of mind, body, and soul. I pray this prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amin, and Amen. If you have said this prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. I'm going to encourage you to get into a Bible-based church or Messianic congregation, one that teaches directly from the Word of God. Very important. And to discern that you are getting correct doctrine, what I'm going to encourage you to do is get a copy of the Bible. I do not tell you what version to get. I, I simply tell you to go to Bible Hub, Bible Gateway, sample out the different versions. The one that you're most comfortable with is most likely the one that you're going to read because you're comfortable with it. That's the first Bible that you should purchase to make a commitment to reading the Bible. Also, you can certainly partake of our Bible studies. We've got two completed Bible studies from cover to cover. The Messianic Jewish Family Bible Tree of Life version is archived uh, on the YouTube channel, the Rumble channel, uh, on our social media platforms, and also the English Standard version from cover to cover was done completely. Uh, we just began doing the New American Standard Bible in January, along with the additional Bible studies of the Tanakh and the Passion Translation. So you can partake of all of that. And it is no, there's no charge. It's all free. It's there for you. It's already done. So you're welcome to it. I, I definitely would also encourage you to get involved in a Bible study with whatever congregation that you join. We can never get enough of the word of God. Develop that relationship with your heavenly father and also, also pray to God. Take some time each day to, to meet with God, to talk to him, talk to, talk to him all day long. He's there for you all day long, all night long. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. 
you are now born again into the family of God, whereby the creator of all things, this world and, and, and humanity, is your heavenly father. And he loves you. He loves you so much. He sent his only begotten son to die for you so that you could be with him in eternity. So yes, he does love you. Yes, he is there for you to develop that relationship with him. Don't get all hung up on denominations. There's not going to be denominations in heaven. That's just more division. And our world has enough division. We don't need any more. Um, it is important to know that you are born again, you're saved, you're a believer in Yeshua. And that is what our heavenly family consists of. Whether you're Jew or non-Jew, uh, it's Jew and non-Jew, Jewish believers in Messiah, Yeshua, all in one family of God. It's And, and actually, our congregation, Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA, we are non-denominational. Non-denominational. We are simply that. We are Jew and non-Jew believer, Jewish believers in Messiah, based on Ephesians chapter 2, the one new man. And that's really what heaven's going to look like. Eternity's going to look like. So there's not going to be Baptists here, Catholics over here. You know, there's not going to be dividing lines for all these divisions. There's not going to be any divisions. We're all children of God coming together to worship the creator of all things. So we're going to bring this Bible study to a close with the Aaronic blessing, or what is known as the priestly blessing. It is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. The Lord spoke to Moses, telling Moses to speak to Aaron and to his sons. Now, Aaron was the high priest during the, those days, and his sons were also Levite priests. So they ministered to the children of Israel. Well, God wanted to put his name on the children of Israel and bless them. He had already decided that the children of Israel were, the, the Israel was his people, his chosen nation of people, and that he would be their God. He set them apart from all the nations on the, on, on the, on the planet and chose them. And so he wanted to give a blessing to them and gave specific words on which he wanted spoken over them. Now, you who are born again and saved, you are, God has put his name on you. He has written his name on you as well, sealed you with his Holy Spirit, and he loves to bless his children. You are part of the commonwealth of Israel when you are born again and saved. You are grafted in to the community as part of the family of God. So this blessing is for you as well. I'm going to say it in Hebrew first, and then I'm going to say it in English. In Hebrew, it goes like this: Ivarekha, Adonai ve'ishmareka, Ya'ei Adonai panavaleka ve'kuneka, Isa Adonai panavaleka, Ve'ya semleka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Have a good rest of your week, everyone. Um, don't forget, um, we've got Rosh Kadesh Sivan coming up. Um, that is the new moon service. We will be bringing on the new month, the new Hebrew calendar month of Sivan. And we will have Holy Communion during that service as well. Um, there are, are the other Bible studies that are available for you, the Tanakh and the New American Standard Bible, which is our main Bible study. So God bless each and every one of you. And again, have a good rest of your week.